Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Love Your Columbia webinar series. My name is Kate Murphy and I'm a community organizer with Columbia Riverkeeper based out of our Portland office. Today's webinar, Restoring the River, what a new super fun site on the Columbia means for public health and clean water. We'll be covering the latest updates about Bradford Island and surrounding waters being listed as a super fun site, what it means to be a super fun site, why Bradford Island was listed, updates on cleanup efforts, what's next, and how you can get engaged. So we have a lot to talk about. Columbia Riverkeeper is proud of our work in solidarity with Yakima Nation to bring public awareness to the toxicity at and around Bradford Island and to encourage the Environmental Protection Agency to list Bradford Island and surrounding waters as a super fun site. We would like to begin today's webinar with a land acknowledgement. We at Columbia Riverkeeper recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between Native peoples and their traditional territories. We respectfully acknowledge that the places we are joining today's webinar from rest on the traditional lands of Native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. I am joining from Portland, which rests on the traditional lands of multiple tribal nations and bands, including Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes here. To learn more about Yakima Nation and other Columbia Plateau tribes, we encourage you to visit the websites for those tribal nations, as well as the Columbia River Inter Intertribal Fish Commission's website, also known as CRITFIC. Uh, throughout the webinar, I will be adding links into the chat uh, with different resources and relevant information, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, we are planning on having a question answer session at the end of the discussion. So keep your questions in mind and I will be asking folks to add their questions into the chat um, for the Q&A session at the end. We are also recording today's webinar. So um, everyone will be receiving an email from me in the next couple of days that it'll include a link to the recording as well as some other relevant information and feel free to share all of those things with your friends. Um, with that, I am very excited to begin what I know is gonna be a great discussion today and I am honored to introduce uh, our panelists. First, we have uh, Laura klasner Shira. Um, Laura is an environmental engineer and hydrologist with Yakima Nation. Laura has over 20 years of experience working on cleanup sites and water quality issues. In the past, Laura has also worked as an environmental engineering consultant, an environmental regulator, and a high school math and science teacher. Laura's work for Yakima Nation Fisheries Program focuses on cleanup and restoration of the Columbia River with the ultimate goal of clean, healthy fish. Um, next, we'll hear from Helen Botcher, who is a remedial project manager in the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Superfund Program office in Seattle, Washington. Helen has more than 25 years of experience working on contaminated sediment investigation and cleanup projects. Helen received a BA in uh, public policy studies from Duke University and an MS in environmental management from the University of San Francisco. Helen and Mr. Rich Francis are going to be jointly leading the EPA's Bradford Island project team. And finally, we'll get to hear from Chris Budai. Chris is a project management manager with the US Army Corps of Engineers in the Portland district. And Chris has a BS degree in geology from the University of Kansas, as well as an MS degree in geology from Portland State University. Chris has been with the Army Corps for 37 years and her work under the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, includes work at the US government moorings located within the Portland Harbor Superfund site and at Bradford Island. Okay, so uh, I know I've been talking a lot and I'm really excited to get this started. So with all of that, I am going to pass it to Laura um, uh, to get us going. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for having me. Um, you can go ahead and, and go to the next slide. I want to give a little bit of a background first uh, to introduce you to the site in case in case it's somewhat new to you. 
Um, Bradford Island is one of the several islands that um, forms part of the Bonneville Dam, which is the most downstream dam on the Columbia River. Next slide. These two pictures show kind of a before and after. I don't, I don't know dates of these pictures, but you can see in the top left picture um, the Bradford Island before the dam was built and after the dam was built in the bottom right picture. Um, I want to give a little bit of a timeline. Um, since time immemorial, there's been a very strong Native American presence in the Bradford Island area. There was even a village site um, right, right in that vicinity. Um, in the 1930s, though, the Bonneville Dam construction began, and from the 1930s to about the 1980s, waste materials from both construction and operation of the dam were dumped into a landfill on the eastern tip of the island, as well as into the river at times. Um, in the late 1990s, the Corps began to compile information and collect information on the contamination and releases from this site. And from about 2000 to 2007, there were several um, interim actions or removal actions uh, that occurred on the eastern tip of Bradford Island and, and right adjacent to it in the water. And then uh, in March, March 2016th of, of 2022, so spring of this year, there was uh, the, the island was NPL listed, national priorities listed, um, with EPA, which means it's now part of the Superfund program um, that some of you may have heard of. To give you a little idea of where we are in the process of cleanup at this site, um, we are in the remedial investigation feasibility study stage. There are, um, work is still ongoing in those stages and we're, uh, the core is filling data gaps and the full nature and extent of contamination is, is still undefined. I want to stress what a heavy lift this NPL listing was. Yakima Nation took the lead in the, initially in the NPL listing effort to try to petition EPA to list this site, but in a rare move, both Washington State and Oregon State joined um, signature on the petition, which is a really unusual thing because it's, it's states generally do not want additional federal involvement in their cleanup sites. But the reasons for this had to do with the lack of funding and progress at the Bradford Island site on the Corps' behalf, as well as some um, very interesting decisions that the Yakima Nation and apparently the states felt were unprotective about um, how cleanup should proceed at this site. There were a lot of concerns, and, and that's the reason why we um, petitioned for this, this site to be listed. Can you go to the next slide, please? This site um, I put in here because I, I want folks to understand wh why Yakima Nation feels like this site is, is such an emergency above and beyond many other NPL listed sites that are, that are also um, federal cleanup sites and, and that people feel are an emergency or an, a, pri a priority for the nation to get cleaned up. Um, this, is a, this is a map that we made of uh, Department of Health fish tissue concentration data for polychlorinated biphenyls. Polychlorinated biphenyls are actually the, the driver for toxicity. There's other chem chemicals or, or um, hazardous substances that uh, contribute to risk here at the site, but PCBs are the driver. And so for human health, um, as, as a screening level of what what starts to be unhealthy, uh, we're looking at something in the range of 0 0.57 parts per billion. Um, and so that's, that's we shouldn't be seeing higher than that in fish um, it, in order to be able to eat them safely and in an unlimited manner. And so um, when we started seeing some of these numbers coming out of Bradford Island in terms of fish tissue concentrations with PCBs in it at over 180,000, parts per billion, we became quite alarmed. And we're, it, we initially were trying to understand how alarmed should we be? <laughs> you know, how does this compare to some of the other sites in the Pacific Northwest? And so part, that's part of why we made this map and looked at some sites like the, the Lower Duwamish, which is um, labeled in the upper uh, left part of this map. Um, it's much higher than that at 640 parts per billion and Portland Harbor at 6,000, over 6,000 parts per billion. And then we thought, you know, there's other sites within the nation that are even more well-known PCB sites. What, 
what do they look like in terms of their maximum fish tissue concentration of PCBs? And so we looked to the Fox River in Wisconsin and Hudson River in New York where PCBs are manufactured and, and Bradford Island just really blew them out of the water. Um, and so you can see the level of alarm Yakima Nation leadership had when they were trying to understand what if someone you know, starting in the 1930s to now has been eating these fish on a regular basis, these resident fish. Um, and I want to stress that these are maximum, looking at maximum values are only one way to look at numbers, but they, they do give us a sense of um, what are we looking at here? How big is the magnitude? Next slide. So knowing that these are really large numbers, um, I want to talk a little bit about what that means for human health and aquatic uh, eco risk. Um, ecosystem risk. Uh, this is a soup of all different kinds of chemicals in here. Polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs is one of them. There's multiple types of pesticides, polycyclic aromatic hy hydrocarbons or PAHs, multiple metals, mercury, phthalates are also contributing to toxicity at this site. They were released from the Bradford Island site. And so when you start looking at these on the individual level, um, they have all different kinds of impacts and target different parts of the body, but when you look at them together, what I guess the take home message is that they affect multiple systems, they affect multiple organs, and they are especially harmful to small children and fetuses and immune and thyroid compromised persons. These are persistent forever bioaccumulating chemicals. They do not go away. In terms of the ecological, ecological system, um, we're especially concerned about tribal, um, tribally significant resources like the ESA listed species and the anadromous fish, as well as the resident fish and shellfish, all and really all levels of the food chain, those below that and, and the birds and mammals that are eating those fish. I wanna stress though that the greatest risk are to the resident species. Um, the resident species are the ones that stay in that area, they feed from that area, they don't leave that area. And so their entire diet is coming from that area. A lot of these other um, ESA listed species, anadromous species that migrate in and out aren't really spending significant amount of time eating there. But what we do now know is when we look at these chemical groups and how they affect fish especially, they, they can result in increased juvenile, juvenile mortality, reduced adult survival, and decreased spawning success. Can you go to the next slide, please? I'm not gonna spend much time on fish consumption advisories because I know our next two speakers will, but I wanted to provide a map at least. Um, this Bradford Island sits within two fish consumption advisories and it's important to note that the entire Columbia River has a fish, has different uh, fish consumption advisories covering the, the entire length of it. And so um, Bradford Island sits within the mid-Columbia advisory area that is, is important for background levels of, of polychlorinated biphenyls and mercury. But when you get in the specific area of Bradford Island and the one mile upstream of that, that's where we're looking at a, a really elevated PCBs and a uh, do not eat any at all resident fish advisory. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about tribal fishing and tribal consumption and why, why this is a little bit more about why this is so alarming. Um, I know when folks think about, a lot of folks at least think about um, tribal fish consumption, they're thinking about salmon especially. And salmon are a very high portion of the diet, but it can vary between family to family and individual to individual. And in fish consumption surveys done in 1994 by Critvic and EPA, resident fish can actually compromise up to 45% of the tribal diet, depending on the individual. It's really important to note that people who are really truly following their cultural lifestyle they are also following the seasons. And so when the seasons aren't um, providing salmon, they're eating other fish, crayfish, shellfish, clams from the river. Um, and they are taught that every fish is a gift from the creator. And so I've heard tribal members say that they will not stop eating fish because of an advisory. That, that's like saying, I'm giving up my lifestyle is, is, is kind of the response. Um, there are multiple in lieu and treaty fishing access sites in very near proximity to the Bonneville Dam. Um, one of them is called Fort Rains and, and the other is Cascade Locks. Um, in addition, 
there's a lot of um, non-tribal fishing. So um, above, sorry, below Bounderville Dam and below Cascade Locks, both there's a lot of bank fishing that goes on by the general public. There's also multiple boat ramps above and below the dam at Cascade Locks, Stevenston, Hamilton Island, Beacon Rock. And, and if you just go online and look at websites for fishing around that area, a lot of the websites will actually promote fishing for salmon, sturgeon, steelhead, walleye, bass, and crappie. So uh, several of those are actually resident fish. Um, I want you to look at this, this photo here is an aerial photo and I thought it was especially telling. It's just from Google Maps. But if you look at this, you can see all kinds of little lines coming out of, especially the Northern shoreline, which is the Washington shoreline. It's equally dotted on the Oregon shoreline. It's just the way that the angle at which this was taken, it doesn't show those fishing platforms as well on the Oregon side. Um, but each of those little lines coming out is, is a family's, tribal fishing platform. It's handed down from family member to family member, generation after generation. And you can see how close these are to Bradford Island. There's also one, um, at least one on Goose Island, which is um, on the Oregon side there. It looks like a little green area within the river directly adjacent to all this, the dark shadow of the trees. And, and there's a fishing platform at the western tip of that that looks out over the eastern end of Bradford Island where some of the hottest contamination has been found. And there are, um, the fish collected in the vicinity of Goose Line Island are also very elevated in fish tissue concentrations. So for Yakima Nation, it's a very big concern for the tribal fishers who are not only feeding themselves, but they're bringing this back to cultural ceremonies they're bringing it back to feed the tribe. They are bringing it back to sell to tribal members. And so um, there are, uh, are quite a few people that are, are eating from this area and they're, they're not necessarily just eating the anadromous fish passing through. Um, I know when the NPL listing happened, Yakima Nation was very encouraged. Um, we really wanted that to, to push for that because we felt like it would bring greater resources, additional expertise. It would bring prior, it would help bring priority, prior, help prioritize the site and bring more of an emergency status to it. It would, um, and it would bring in the, um, the requirement that EPA concurred with decisions, cleanup decisions that were made along the way. We were very concerned of the disparity between how the core interprets CERCLA, which is the federal cleanup law, and how other federal agencies are interpreting the federal cleanup law CERCLA. Um, the, the core's decision seems to be, seem to be le a lot less protective than other federal agencies. And so when this was listed in March of 2022, we were, we were excited. Um, and we met with core leadership a month later in April of 2022. We met with, uh, we had a government to government meeting at the head of the, the tribal council table with the with Colonel Helton and other members of, of the Corps. And it was a, a very promising meeting in which Colonel Helton made multiple promises of we, that they would work towards uh, completion of a federal facilities agreement, which is the very first part of um, the NPL process of, is coming to an agreement of how to work together and, and what will be completed and when it will be completed. Um, he also promised that um, committed to meaningful en engagement with the Yakima Nation and to treat this site with an emergency status. And unfortunately, even though that was a great meeting, within about 60 days, we kind of lost, backtracked on all those promises. Um, since then, the Corps has cut the Yakima Nation off the out of the government team, so we are no longer in, in communication with the Corps on technical topics. Um, the Corps has still not provided Yakima Nation their legal analysis of why. So we, we don't really know how to talk about this with them because we don't have an understanding of why we're cut out. Um, instead of working with Yakima Nation, the Corps seems to be working against the Yakima Nation, not recognizing Yakima Nation's treaty rights, not recognizing Yakima Nation's rights under CERCLA law, under federal cleanup law. It's incredibly disrespectful. Um, when it comes to the federal, federal facilities agreement, the FFA, 
um, those negotiations are going on right now between the core, the EPA and the states, and that is the first step. Our understanding is that's that's not going well. Um, it's not proceeding in good faith on the part of the core. Um, and when we look at the administrative record that the core is providing to EPA, it still doesn't appear to be complete. Many of the links are broken. Um, and so it's unclear if EPA even has the adequate information. Um, however, on the, on the other side of things, we understand that the core is moving full speed ahead on investigations that previously had been started before NPL listing, but also starting up new ones without addressing past government concern, government team concerns or um, on the ones that were already started or um, involving the government team in the process for the new work that's being started. Uh, and this doesn't seem in line with how NPL sites should proceed or how uh, work should proceed, work shouldn't be proceeding before an FFA like this. And it's also not clear to us, the Nation or the rest of the government team when we ask, who do we talk to within the core? It's not clear who within the core is making decisions. And so it is very difficult for, it's been very difficult for Yakima Nation to negotiate through this and try to figure out, well, how do we even begin a conversation to start um, rectifying this? So I just wanna end with, you know, Yakima Nation's continued role, role with, uh, approximately 80% of the tribal fishers in zone six, which, which is where this is located. Um, this is an emergency for Yakima Nation. Yakima, need, Yakima Nation leadership and staff have, and consultants have been working on this for over 17 years. We have a lot of site knowledge and expertise and we're not going away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your scientific perspective, for framing the very real current and past um, impacts on public health that occur from the contamination at Radford Island. And I know that there's a lot of history here. And thank you for expressing the concerns um, on behalf of Yakima Nation. I, I really just want to reiterate how much I appreciate um, the three of you panelists coming together uh, to have this conversation together um, today and to try and address some of these concerns and really share with the public how um, our, our shared commitment moving forward to making sure that this public health emergency is addressed in an, in an efficient way. So thank you, Laura, and, and, and all of you for being a part of this conversation. And I want to move next to Helen. Um, I'm going to pass to you and you can take it from here. Thank you, Helen. Well, thank you so much, Kate, um, for your opening remarks. And, and thank you, Laura, for your slides um, and the information you shared with everyone. I want to start out just by talking a little bit about the NPL listing. Um, we are I'm very excited to be here. And EPA Region 10 is very excited about this new Superfund list listed site. It's been a while since we've added new sites to the Superfund. Uh, and so this is our newest one, and it was added to the Superfund list officially, formally in April of 2022. That's when the listing became effective. And Yakima Nation and other tribes, Oregon, Washington, all requested that we list the site on the NPL. And I want to give a shout out to Columbia Riverkeeper because Lauren Goldberg and her team really helped spread the word about the potential listing. They generated a lot of public awareness and interest in the site. And that really was very helpful to EPA. We received more than 1,700 comments from individual members of the public. And the vast majority of those comments supported adding the site to the Superfund list. And those comments made a huge difference in our decision. And so I also want to thank everyone on this call who took the time to get educated uh, and to make their opinions known. We, we appreciate and we very much um, use and, and take seriously all comments that we receive from the public. Next slide, please. So what, has, what is the impact of the Superfund listing? I, I wanna, there's a couple key points that I wanna make here because some things have changed pretty significantly and other things have not changed. And so I wanna be clear with everyone about that. 
EPA is now at the table um, and we are gonna be working hand in hand with the core to implement the cleanup at this site. EPA oversight will ensure that the cleanup is done in a way that's consistent with the Superfund law and with EPA guidance. And that it's also done in a way that's consistent with the relevant provisions of Washington and Oregon cleanup statutes. And this process will be governed by a federal facilities agreement. Laura mentioned that that's underway. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that more in a, a future slide. But there's some important things that have not changed. And I think it's really key that everyone understand this. The Corps of Engineers is the lead federal agency and they are still the lead federal agency for the cleanup. It's the Corps and their team that will be conducting the investigations and ultimately implementing the cleanup decisions that we make. The other point I wanna make is that while this listing brought new attention and priority to the site, it did not create or bring into effect a new source of funding. And I know that may be disappointing to some people and there may be a misconception that somehow we can use the Superfund um, resources and that is not true. Doing so would really violate an important principle in the Superfund law and that is that the polluter should pay for the contamination. In this case, it's the Corps of Engineers um, that, that did you know, release the materials into the environment. So it's the core that will be paying for the cleanup along with Bonneville Power Administration. So that those things have not changed as a result of the listing. You can go ahead, Kate, next slide. So what has EPA been doing since, since April, since the listing? We've really been focusing on two things. Um, first, we've been working on those federal facility negotiations. And I'm gonna walk through some bullets here. Uh, there's a lot to this federal facility agreement. It will do several things for us. It really kind of sets the table and establishes the roles and responsibilities of our agencies. It will lay out a clear dispute resolution process. So when we have a disagreement, a technical disagreement or a disagreement about priorities or how to proceed, there will be a clear process for us to clear, quickly resolve those disagreements so that we can just keep the process moving forward. And I think that's gonna be very important for us. It will include a site management plan and that will lay out the path forward, the kind of administrative path forward. And it will also include a schedule. And that site management plan is something that is a living document. It's updated typically every year. So, and it will be much more detailed for the first year or two, and then more general as we move out in time with regard to dates. But it will contain in a schedule, and that's an enforceable schedule. So EPA will be able to um, seek stipulated financial penalties from the core if they fail to complete something that they committed to and that they got funding to perform it. If they just don't do it, there, there are penalties under the FFA. The agreement will confirm that EPA is the decision maker if the agencies can't agree. And it also will lay out a clear list of documents that are require EPA concurrence. Those are considered primary documents under the FFA. And then there's a, then all the other documents are secondary documents and EPA will have the ability to review and provide comments on those documents, but we don't have concurrence on secondary documents. So that's one of the key things that we negotiate is what documents are in the primary list and what are secondary documents. Uh, we have EPA and the core agreed um, and we committed to the tribes that we're gonna do our very best to get this agreement um, negotiated within a year. And it will be signed by the Army, EPA, Oregon and Washington. Those will be the four signatories to this agreement is an interagency agreement. So that's been a big focus for us is, is negotiating that FFA and those negotiations are still underway. Um, we are still hopeful that we can meet our target goal of getting that agreement in place in the spring. But the other thing we've been doing is really working on getting up to speed on the site and reviewing all the existing information and the site data. That's helping us in understand all the work that's been done to date 
uh, identify where there are data gaps and it's informing our thinking about what the site management plan and the schedule should be moving forward. You can go ahead, Kate. So I do want to emphasize what the what the key risks are. You know, we've we've looked at the site data and and we agree that Laura correctly identified it is risk to people that are consuming resident fish in the area. That is the clearest, most important risk driver. There is some low level risk for direct contact with soil in the upland area of the site, but by far the biggest risk driver is fish tissue. And it would be faster for me to go over the list of fish that are safe to eat than not safe to eat. Um, the, the anatomous fish, the salmon, the steelhead, the shad and lamprey, those, the concentrations in those fish are low enough that it's, they do not qualify for an advisory. It's the resident fish, including bass, smallmouth bass and largemouth bass, but also crappie, you know, walleye, those fish within the area Department of Oregon Department of Health has issued a health advisory. And as Laura mentioned, it is a do not eat advisory. So we really encourage people that catch fish within that area, if they catch resident fish, to not eat those fish. Next slide. So I also want to talk a little bit about community involvement. Um, it's so great. I know we had a large number of people signed up for this webinar and it is really wonderful to see that there's still public interest um, in this site. EPA has found over a long time and experience at these sites that we always make better decisions when there's an active community involved. Our decisions then reflect the community's desire for the site and how the site's gonna be used um, and we tend to make decisions that last longer over time. So we really value community input. But every site is different. And what, how we do community involvement really needs to be dictated by the community, by the level of interest and by the, the type of interest. If people are interested in just broader updates on occasion, if they're only interested in the cleanup action or if they wanna be involved, um, throughout the entire process and, and review all the technical documents with us as we go forward. And I wanna be clear here that in their lead role, the Corps of Engineers is the lead agency for community involvement and they will be developing a community involvement plan. And that plan will lay out how the Corps will involve members of the community in the cleanup process moving forward. And so we will support the core and the community in that plan um, and look forward to learning more about that. I know that the, Chris is gonna talk a little bit more about community involvement in her slides. So you could go ahead. Um, and lastly, I just wanna introduce our team. Um, that's me there on the right, but my colleague Rich Francis on the left is a co-project manager with me. I'm in the Seattle office and Rich is down in Portland. And then another key person on our team is Laura Knudsen. Um, she's there in the middle. And I wanted everyone to have this slide so you have our contact details. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions that we don't have time to get to today, or if you have questions anytime throughout the process, we are always available to you. And with that, I think I'd, I wanna leave some time for Chris. So why don't you go ahead, Kate? Thank you so much, Helen. Um... This is all, you know, again, I just am so enthused to have this powerful panel together to discuss this in, in, in the same space as someone with a background in public health. This conversation gives me so much hope. This is a location that really we can see cleaned up in my lifetime. And I just have so much appreciation for all of you for helping folks understand you know, the, the different pieces of the process, the issues of concern. And I'm excited to pass to Chris now to help us understand a little bit more about um, the process from the Army Corps side. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kate. And I'd like to thank the Columbia Riverkeeper for inviting us to be part of this panel discussion. Really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to uh, informing everybody in the public what's going on uh, at Bradford Island. And I just wanna say first and foremost, the Corps does take this cleanup site very seriously. And we are all about 
providing a protective uh, environment for human health and the environment as we move forward through the CERCLA process. Next slide, please. Uh, I am the project manager based out of Portland and Portland District with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the technical work that's going on, the community involvement, the regulatory oversight uh, with the listing of the site, and uh, the, most importantly, the upcoming event, we do plan to hold a public meeting to provide information to the public on October 19th. And I'll stay, uh, say more about that uh, later in the presentation. So next slide, please. Uh, we'll start with the circular process. And uh, I don't know how uh, familiar people are with this process, but it's a very rigorous process uh, that we go through in order to identify, is there a problem at the site? If there is, what's the nature and extent of it? And then assess the risk associated with that. And then you take that information to develop your feasibility studies that help identify alternatives for cleanup. And you go forward in the process to uh, hone in on what the remedial uh, action should be with the proposed plan that does go out for public comment before it comes back. We address all the concerns uh, that come back through that comment period and, and try to issue a final rod. And we then after the rod, you go into the design phase for cleaning up the site, then you implement the cleanup, and then you follow that with long-term monitoring for as long as, need, as needed. And, th and that's just kind of a very brief uh, overview of that long circle of process. And as mentioned previously, we are in that remedial investigation slash feasibility study phase to one degree or another. And as we went through this process early on, we identified contamination and we developed two operable units. One is called the river operable unit, which is shown in the left diagram in blue. And it basically goes from the dam upstream for about a mile. And then the other operable unit was the upland operable unit. And that's the Eastern half of Bradford Island that starts at the dam and goes to the tip of the island. And on the diagram on the right, I've blown up the upland operable unit. So you can see that close up and you'll see other colored areas in red, gold, purple, and you can barely see the green. And those, areas are areas of potential concern. The gold is the landfill area. That's what we were first alerted to back in the, in nine, the late 90s, that there was a landfill there and there may be stuff in there that should not be there. And so they started the investigation at the landfill and then it expanded to the purple area, the pistol range where target practice used to occur. So there's a lot of lead in the soil in that area from the bullets. And then uh, we have the area in red, the largest area, and that's an area we call the sandblast area. And there was a sandblast building there, sandblasting occurred on site. This is an industrial site. And, and so that part of the maintenance of equipment at the dam, they would sandblast it. And that produced a lot of sandblast grit that had uh, metals primarily as the contaminant. And then on the bulb slope, which you can barely see on the northern shore of the island is, is where uh, light bulbs and other uh, types of bulbs were disposed of just on the slope. And, and uh, so that was an area of potential concern. Uh, next slide. In 2002, in, in part of that investigation of the landfill and, and the bulb slope and, and the other areas of potential concern, we did a survey in the river with divers and discovered there was a lot of material that was in the river that had been disposed of in the river, electrical equipment primarily. And so we went back in in 2002 to remove that debris from the river. And in the removal of that debris discovered that there was uh, 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 some transformers that had been put in there and they are oil bearing transformers from uh, the past and that oil had leaked out. So we knew we 
probably had a problem there with oil in the substrate. And so some investigations were done and a contract was put together and executed in 2007 to remove sediment. And you can see in the lower diagram, the shaded areas, removal area one, two, and three were areas where we had a diver, diver assisted hydraulic dredging take place to basically remove contaminated sediment in those areas um, and disposed of properly. So the next slide uh, talks about our, I'm kind of fast forwarding to current activities. We, from, from all that information, we did put together a remedial investigation that was uh, published in 2012, I believe. And in 2016, we did a baseline risk assessment based on that information. And that was done in 2016, I believe. And for the upland, we initially uh, finalized a feasibility study uh, that included just the landfill and pistol range because those were the areas that rose to a level that needed remediation. Since then, in working with the tribes and the community and the states, we are we were in the process of revising that upland feasibility study to also include the sandblast area. Uh, there was some discussion about whether that was uh, to be assessed for just human health because it's an industrial site or should the environmental eco risk be applied also. And after many discussions internally in the army and, and with uh, others in the community and other stakeholders, it was decided that it should be managed for the environment as well as human health, which uh, made the areas uh, needing to be remediated. So we were in the process of revising our feasibility study to include the sandblast area for remediation, as well as addressing upland source control, which included the uh, bulb slope. So in the process of uh, preparing those revisions to the upland feasibility study, we had uh, sampled stormwater and that report is being finalized. We also sampled in the sandblast area that report's being finalized. These reports are data reports. And uh, we did an optimization review uh, at the request of EPA. Uh, and that showed that our groundwater sampling was over 10 years old. We maybe wanted to sample again and see if things were the same. And so we did sample again this last summer and things are pretty much the same. And that report's being finalized. So those are current activities, basically filling data gaps and, and preparing reports with that data. And um, in the river operable unit, we have done in 2020, I believe we did the passive sampling all along the North shore to get just an idea of uh, what remains in the sediment in that area. And, and just to, to clarify, there's not a lot of sediment there because there's a lot of currents with the spillway operations at the dam. And so it's more of a cobbly uh, substrate rather than sand. And, and so that's what we discovered when we did this uh, passive sampling study. We also did uh, some tissue sampling of fish to see where we are today. Uh, enough time has passed since the removal action in 2007, and we wanted to see if that had any effect, and, and we believe it did. We've just re recently received a lot of this data. We did some tissue sampling in 2020 and just recently in 2022, and we're also tracking movements of the fish, primarily bass, and just to inform us on, on the nature and extent of, of the the risk and the contamination. And so the, the good news is, is that the levels of contamination are, are definitely lower, but they're still elevated and need to be remediated. And so that's the information that will feed into any remedial alternatives we look at. Uh, the uh, plan is to also do some additional sediment uh, sampling where we can in the four bay, again, filling data gaps and trying to hone in on the nature and extent, the limits of the contamination. And right now we're seeing most of the contamination is concentrated along the North shore of Bradford Island, where 
the equipment that, uh, that was removed from the river. It seems to be very consistently associated with those former debris piles that remo were removed in 2002. And along with sediment sampling, we plan to collect flow data and do some modeling. And that will also help inform uh, the alternative designs for the river because it's a very dynamic environment and we need some of this information in order to even uh, design a remedial alternative that would stay in place. We need to know what the currents are doing there and what the hydraulic modeling shows us. And, and that's what that effort is for. So most of our current activities are, are basically uh, putting together reports of data we've already collected to fill data gaps or collecting more data that has been previously identified as data gaps and trying to fill those gaps uh, so that we can then move forward. Of course, our other activities are assisting with the federal facility agreement negotiations. And that is taking a lot of time. And so there's really not a lot of quote technical work going on right now to collaborate with stakeholders on because the focus right now is getting that agreement done. And, and like EPA, we have a target of trying to get that done within a year at least a draft uh, federal facility agreement. I, I really don't know how long it will take for Department of Army to sign the document, but we certainly want to hammer out all the details with EPA and get that draft document uh, routing for signature within a year's time frame. So next slide uh, covers the community involvement. This is another item that is is uh, we're focused on because we had a community involvement plan that was developed in 2005 and we had a, a community group that was engaged in the project and once we did the 2007 cleanup the group uh, decided that they no longer needed to meet until there was more activity going on to be discussed and so it was kind of put on the back burner since then. And, and with the listing of the site, we felt a need to revisit that, revise our community involvement plan and go out to the community again and conduct those interviews and uh, that will help inform uh, the revisions in our community involvement plan. And we have been doing that. Some of you uh, uh, that have called in may have participated in these interviews and we're still open to people contacting us and, and wanting to do an interview and basically uh, provide information about community awareness of the project and, and uh, interest in participating in a community advisory group as we go forward. And the results so far from our interviews, there's, there's a lot of pub, uh, community interest in participating in the community advisory group. So we will be standing that up and we'll provide more information at our upcoming public meeting. And we, at the same time, we're revising our community involvement plan and the public will have access to that to comment on it. And uh, as I mentioned, our, our public meeting is coming up because one of the things that really caught our attention during all the interviews was that the public does not know about the fish advisory or they don't have an understanding of what it means. And we realize that's an urgent matter and very serious, it's a high risk. And we want to make sure the public's aware and informed about this fish advisory. So our public meeting will focus on that fish advisory. We've invited Oregon Health Authority to be part of our public meeting and they will provide a presentation on that advisory and answer any questions the public may have. At the same time, we wanted to provide the public information about our project at Bradford Island, what we've been doing and where we are at this point in time on the circle process and, and where we're going in the future. And uh, EPA has been invited to participate in our public meeting and, and Helen, I think she and her team will be there to provide information about the listing and answer any questions the public may have about that. So I invite everybody to call in or participate if you can and uh, look forward to that. So our next slide covers a little bit about the fish advisory. We've already heard a lot about that. 
And as Helen said, it's probably quicker to talk about what's safe to eat, the migratory fish or safe to eat, not the resident fish. And, and uh, there'll be more about that at our public meeting. So the next slide covers the regulatory oversight. So with the listing, uh, that put EPA as the lead regulator. And we had previously been inviting EPA to all our meetings, but they had chosen not to engage because the state of Oregon primarily, but also the state of Washington were acting as the regulators. But now that the site's been listed, that put EPA as the lead regulator. And so they have stepped up and started participating in the project. The states are support agencies. And as Helen mentioned, those three entities are involved in the negotiations with the federal facility agreement. And the role of the Army Corps of Engineers is as the lead agency, since it is a federal facility, it's at Bonneville Project. And so we still have all the same responsibilities and functions uh, in this circle cleanup. And we acknowledge that and embrace that and look to clean this site up to be safe and protective for human health and the environment. And I mentioned the federal facility agreement already that we're in the process of negotiating with EPA. And we've, we've had a lot of back and forth about primary and secondary documents and, and we are poised now to move, I think, uh, hopefully very quickly into the site management plan discussions once we finalize the discussion about our primary and secondary documents. And that has to do with trying to document what we've done. We've been working on this site for a long time and a lot of work's been done. And so that whole primary secondary document discussion has to do with what will EPA agree to give the core credit for and where are we on that circle of process and, and that you pretty much have to establish that before you can then discuss, well, what are the next steps? Because you have to establish where you are in the process to figure out where you go from there in the circle process. So the next slide I think covers the public meeting, which I've talked about. It is uh, being held if you wanna attend in person at Cascade Lock City uh, Council Chambers, and but we will have a virtual meeting. So if you'd like to be there in person, we'll have like a open house with stations uh, starting at 5.30 to about 6.30 when the virtual meeting starts. And those stations are basically where you can get information about the fish advisory, about Bradford Island, about the listing of the site, and also about community uh, involvement. So those are the four stations we plan to have there and have information about. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide that shows where you can get more information about this public meeting and uh, and the next slide, which I think is our last slide, is other links that are available to everyone that, that gives you information about Bradford Island and the administrative record. And if you want to make any comments, there's a link for that. And we're also on social media at Twitter and Facebook. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Kate. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, again, we I really, appreciate so much all of you coming together to help kind of put the pieces together on this complex project that's got a lot of history and a lot of um, human impacts that that we need to consider um, and I did put also that link um, to the public forum that the Army Corps is hosting in the chat for folks if they want to um, check that out we do have a few minutes for some Q&A and I've had a few questions coming through already um, and uh, any questions that we don't get to, I'll do my best to try and circle back. Um, but if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A section. And I'm gonna start off, we did talk a little bit about um, how folks can get engaged in this process. And I think there's a couple of options, but I just want, we got a, a, a question about Clean, being engaged, the best way for the public to be engaged in the process. And I just wanted, maybe this is for a few of you, a few of you but I wanted to reiterate the, um, both the comment period that's gonna be available and then some of the community involvement. So um, either maybe Helen or Chris wanna jump in on just reiterating some of those public involvement opportunities. Like 
commenting on the federal facilities agreement, for example. Uh, Helen, I'll go first if you want. Um, sure, go ahead, Chris. The, the core is, is hoping that the community advisory group will be that place where the public can be fully engaged in the project and get information about the project and have in-depth technical discussions about the project also. That's where the core intends to bring our draft documents for public uh, a review and comment so we can take all that under consideration as we finalize those documents. And, and uh, we may, I don't know, we, we have to figure this out and this would be in collaboration with the public, uh, whether we have any subcommittees that are dedicated to more uh, technical focused discussions that then would report back to the CAG. It just depends how many people are interested in in-depth technical discussions versus more project updates and status updates. And, and we'll work with the community on that, what works best for them and how often they wanna meet and, and where they wanna meet, but it should be a community led effort in that respect. Um, on the FFA, I'll let Helen address that, but I believe after we have a, a draft FFA that does go out for public review and comment. Go ahead, Helen. Yeah, Chris, thanks for that. Um, Chris is correct. That is um, a document that is subject to formal public comment period. So before that agreement, including that site management plan and, and the initial schedule becomes a final document, it is available for the public to review and comment on. And then there's, there's another key step in the process. If nothing else, we really do wanna hear from people when it comes time for the proposed plan. And the proposed plan is the draft cleanup plan. And I expect that there'll be more than one proposed plan at this site. I, I would guess that we're gonna have at least two, one for the upland and one for the inwater, but we could have multiple proposed plans depending on how ultimately we end up organizing the work. But the proposed plan says very clearly what options we considered for the cleanup plan and then what option um, the government is recommending. And then we take public comment on that. And that's a formal public comment period. It's open for at least 30 days. We take written comments. There, there can be a public meeting if, if it's requested. And we're required to respond to those public comments and take that public feedback into consideration before we issue a final cleanup decision. So I wanna encourage everyone, you know, that, that's gonna be several years away, um, I think before we have proposed plans, but that is a key point in the decision process when we really will be looking for public input. So I wanted to highlight those two opportunities, the federal facility agreement and our upcoming proposed plans. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and combine a couple of questions because we have limited time. So we have a question um, that starts out about what is the best way people can support the work of Yakima Nation and their part and Yakima Nation's participation in the process? And that's kind of connected to another question, which is with respect to the FFA process, are the public and tribes legally excluded from it because it's a negotiation among states and federal agencies? Can you explain a little bit more about this? So I want to first pass to Laura to address how folks can support and then maybe um, somebody else can jump in on the FFA requirements? Well, I, I guess we're trying to figure that out too, because we're, we're not really sure who's calling the shots within the core. Um, but I, I do know that um, reaching out to, to the core, reaching out to EPA, reaching out to your legislators who are very interested in this site, like Blumenauer, Merkley, um, on the Washington side, Butler Herrera, um, those, those politicians have have expressed great interest in this, seeing the site move along and become a protective cleanup. And Kate, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to the FFA process. It is a confidential process. It's a negotiation among four uh, government entities and we need to respect the confidentiality of those, those negotiations. And we promised the Yakima Nation that we would collaborate and coordinate with them through the FFA negotiations. We recognize that the Yakima has extensive knowledge and understanding of the site. We value their technical input and we wanna make sure that we design a cleanup plan that takes full knowledge and, and makes the best use of all of that 
insight and information that they have to bring to the table. So we're hoping to figure out a way to make, make that happen. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we had more time. We are going to have some future webinars and I hope to continue this discussion. Thank you all so much to the panelists for joining us, to our tech team, Maria and Liz, for helping us out, and to all of you who joined us today. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. I've just added a number of links into the chat um, that have some things you can do if you're feeling inspired as we wrap up. I hope you're feeling as inspired as I am about a clean and safe Bradford Island and surrounding waters. So there's a, a link to a petition in there um, urging for a, a effective FFA. There's um, a fact sheet and we encourage you to share all this information with your networks to attend the Army Corps Public Forum. And lastly, I know a lot of you may be wondering how you can support Columbia Riverkeepers work further. And the best way to empower work like this is to become a member of Columbia Riverkeeper. Um, you can do that a couple of ways with a donation or recurring contribution on the website or over the phone. And the link is in the chat for that. So thank you again so much to all of you for your participation. And I look forward to uh, collaborating with you in the future. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.